Well, a very warm welcome to Sir James Hardy. Jim, a 50-year member of the CYC this year. How and when did sailing become part of your life? Well, I think I didn't really get the bug, Peter, until about I was 10 years old. Brighton and Seacliff Yacht Club. I was crewing in dinghies around 1940 when I was eight or nine. And then when the Japanese look like they're going to get down to Australia, uh, Mum sent me off to Port Vincent, where we went as a family, due west of Adelaide, across the Gulf and York Peninsula. And uh, she sent me there and I lived with the Coral family on a farm, uh, 1941-42. And I vividly remember the headmaster at the Port Vincent School, the only master, <laughs> Mr. Trelaw, calling us all together February 42, and he told us Darwin has just been bombed mm -hmm. by the Japanese, and it's the same admiral and his ships that bombed Pearl Harbor, etc., etc. So I have that vivid <laughs> memory of, of the problem in Darwin, but I came back to uh, Adelaide start of 43 and that's when I got in into the old family cadet dinghy Peter and you had success in the cadets oh not 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 early success right, right. no I was last and second last and last but you got the, you got the bug though the sailing I, bug. I got the bug and yeah. uh, in fact the fellow that really turned me around was the Hardy's wine manager in Sydney a close friend of my late father too uh, Ralph Kelly he came down once a year and barbecued our family home at Seacliff, and he uh, came out and I was repairing Mermaid, the cadet dinghy, where I'd anchored it overnight and the bloody <laughs> anchor line broke and a couple of planks were split and I was repairing them. And he asked me, how am I going with the sailing? And I said, oh, look, uh, Mr. Kelly, uh, my sails, I've got to repair them every week. They, it's 1943, middle of the Hitler's war. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> He said, no, no new sales. I said, no, no. Oh, Lord, I said, as a matter of fact, yeah, Mr. Sultan Dremoyne in Sydney, mm -hmm. W. Sultan and son, he, he has made a suit of sales for a lad at uh, Largs Bay, but mum, we couldn't afford it. But anyway, a few months later, the mother said, there's a parcel from Sydney. And I said, oh, what's in the parcel, mum? She said, oh, I don't know. Fibbing, of course, in an Irish form. <laughs> and I opened it up and it was a jib and maidsel from W. Sultan and Son. Mm -hmm. Beautiful Japara, tal uh, Egyptian cotton. cotton yeah. Well, I could still smell the <laughs> Stockholm tar in the bolt rope, Peter. Hey? <laughs> oh, no, I, I, I definitely started getting above second to last. <laughs> I was third to last. Fourth. And then I built my first cadet dinghy. And away, away I went, really. Yeah, yeah. And um, at that time was Nerida, the yacht Nerida, that's now in your family. Yes. It, was that part of the family then? No, no. Tell us a bit about the history of Nerida. Well, Nerida, Dad, uh, he spent quite a lot of money with a naval architect in Sydney called Bailey, lived at Como from memory, and Dad had had two second-hand boats, the, the Katie and then the Norelli, 36 footer and a 38 footer, I think, Norelli. Uh, but he wanted his own sort of dream yacht, and he, he wanted a yacht about 33 feet on the waterline, about 40 feet overall. And he spent this money with, with Bailey, and in the finish, he didn't like the profile of the boat. And he sent photolithographs to Alfred Milne in Glasgow, who was really, he and Fife were good friends and great competitors, but Dad evidently chose Milne, and Milne wrote back and, and said that the, uh, sorry for his inquiry about a small cutter, uh, but they'd been very busy that summer <laughs> on the Clyde. Well, for Adelaide, a 40-footer wasn't that small no. for Adelaide, but he said, Milne said, the Australian design would be a sturdy little ship, but we feel we would not be out of place in saying she is rather old-fashioned. And if we could make another observation, the fastening of the stem to the keel is insufficiently strong. <laughs> Strange choice of words, but you got what he was meaning. Well, back came 
back came the design, and I loved it. Milne, because uh, my father, about wanting a more attractive profile, I mean, he didn't want long overhangs like the meter boats, and Dad said in the first letter to him, and back came the design, Nerida. F 33 feet on the waterline. He hadn't given the boat as much overhang for it as he would have liked, but he has taken the counter out to boat out to 45 feet to help with your requirement for a more attractive profile, although looks are largely a matter of taste. <laughs> I mean, the correspondence, Pete, you can get in a dinghy now and look at Nerida and, and see the correspondence. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, wonderful. And but when... Dad was killed in a commercial air crash, mm. 1938. Ironic, Peter, that it was bad navigation. Mm. And there's Dad holding Australia's first master yachtsman certificate, which basically, ticket number one, uh, the School of Mines, University of Adelaide. And part of, it, part of the thing was that he could take any vessel that he owned into any port in the world without a pilot. Wow. And there he is down after the DC-2 and the navigator, I think old codger, and a young trainee lad, I think. They thought they were going over either Dalesford or Sunbury, west of, west, west of, uh, of uh, Essendon. And the Essendon said, oh, very low cloud on the runway. Well, they lowered into what was very low cloud, but they weren't going over Sunbury. They, they're going over Dandenong mm. Township. And he lowered the plane into the bloody Mount Dandenong fog. And they were all killed, mm. about 26 people from memory, mm. honeymoon couple and lawyers. And, mm. But they did have a, a Royal Commission because one of the guys killed was Charles Hawker, who they thought might well become South Australia's first Prime Minister. and. Uh, so they had this, and they'd been talking about radio beacons, mm. and they did. The, the uh, commission said, look, we've got to put them in. And the radio beacons, they flew, the plane had to fly, you know, not directly, not just a rum line course, over a particular beacon. And Essendon knew where the plane was, and the plane knew where it was. Mm. And South Australian air navigation has never looked back since the Kaima disaster. Mm -hmm. And you, Touchwood. you were a very young man, at, well, boy at the time of lost I was a, I was only five. Yeah, I, wow. Well, I was so nearly six, three mm. weeks short of my sixth wow. birthday. Wow. And I clearly remember I was at kindergarten at uh, Brighton and I'd come home because some of the winery blokes were delivering some slate and paving around our family home, slate. And I was out, you know, getting under their feet, I suppose. <laughs> Mum came round the corner to tell me, she said, you know, Jim, da your dad's been killed in an yeah. aeroplane crash and we're going to have to sort of stick together. Mm -hmm. Words like that, and I can, I clear, I could take you to within a metre of where she told me. Mm, how sad. And, and of course, Mum tried to keep Narada. In fact, she... She was such a keen yachtswoman, she wanted to bring us up on the Derrida, but some of her girlfriends said, oh, look, Eileen, I think that's a bit, that's a bit of a long <laughs> a shot. A bridge too far, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, a bridge too far. <laughs> but then um, Nerida was sold to Colin Hazelgrove. That's right. And he went on to win the 1950 Hobart race. He did, and mm. Colin was Uncle Colin. He was my mentor, both in my sailing and in business later. He was our next door neighbour, and when I was building boats, Colin used to come in, you know, at nine o'clock at night or something, and I can remember building the Sharpie before the 56 Olympic trials, and Colin came in and he's talking to me, and, and he, he said, shut up and get on. I didn't come in here to talk to you, Jim. <laughs> he just stood, he just stood, but it was a sort of an acknowledgement, wasn't it? Yeah, lovely. No, he was a, he was a tough hombre, but a good sailor and a good businessman. No, Colin was pretty special. Yeah. And Jim, um, ocean racing, how did you get involved with ocean racing? You did some early Sydney Hobarts on Southern Myth, was it? Did Southern you? Myth. Yeah. Mm. Norm Howard. <laughs> yeah. 
Norman the Gloom. Gloomy Howard, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the Gloom. <laughs> but he chicken. I couldn't eat chicken for, for years. <laughs> uh, didn't matter how you cooked it, you could still smell it. <laughs> and, uh, but Norm, amazing bloke. Yeah, well, the yacht was built at, at Searles, R.T. Searle and Sons at Port Adelaide, and they built Nerida. So I was really aware of Searles and been there getting bits and pieces over the years. And so I was there helping a little bit with the build of the boat. But it was a, a second or third race, 55. A uh, couple of my crew, Dick Bartholomeus and... Uh, Peter Sivright, we sailed in uh, in the Southern Myth, and he was an amazing bloke. You know, sort of asexual. What what's the word? You know, I think some people thought he was a bit uh, a nature's bachelor, but right. I don't believe that's true. He he's just married to his boats and his yachting and his photography and mm -hmm. and uh, but he's seasick, Pete. I mean. <laughs> He had the he had the on the deck head above his bunk, he had the chart, you know. I mean, and he, he I think fourteen or fifteen, you'd know the number, fourteen, and he never bumped any rocks anywhere. No. Well, he, every year he'd come round for the Hobart race from Adelaide, bring the boat round. Yeah. And he'd introduced a lot of people to ocean racing from my South word, Australia. My word, he did. My yeah. word, he did. Yeah. In fact, in fact, when he had the smaller boat, uh, Nereid which was like a development of the 21-foot restricted class, a uh, slightly bigger Derwent class, it was called. Mm. And in fact, my first sort of, not ocean race, but at least it was a race from Outer Harbour to Glenelg and back, the La Hunt Cup, I did with Norm on the Nereid. And I reckon that would have been, I was sailing my 12-foot cadet dinghy at the time. And that was the start really of uh, going a bit further than just a dinghy. Yeah. You mentioned the Sharpies um, yeah. and the Olympics. Did you do the trials for the Melbourne Games? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Roly Tasker. Yeah. Oh, smart cookie. Good sailor. A smart cookie, <laughs> but he rubbed me out after three races. But how smart was this? Because because I'd won one and twice were in runner-up to him. I had fixed pumps. I could pump the water into the centre case of the Sharpie. We did that. All our Sharpies in Australia had, had some of them had the old fashioned cross pumps, but most of us had pumps that spring loaded and you pumped bilge water into the centre casing and all being well, <laughs> it just stayed there or went into the ocean. Well, anyway, the pumps had to be loose. Well, they were loose when the boat was measured, but when I was using them, of course, I uh, the wing nut, you know, <laughs> not a good <Gordon> ingate. No, no. <laughs> anyway, and but Tasker, he waited till the third race. I mean, oh no, he, he, he could he had to get up early to beat Tasker because <laughs> I then only had four races left out of seven, and it wasn't enough to. Were they the heavyweight sharpies yeah, or heavy the heavyweight sharpies? sharpies? Yeah, yeah, and they used them in the '36 Olympics, Pete in. Uh, Berlin, right. the Sharpie. Right. Yeah. The German designed, two brothers, I think, designed right. the Sharpie. Yeah. Yeah. And it's amazing, the lightweight Sharpie is still going strong Absolutely. in Australia. yeah. Well, some famous names have sailed those and had victories. One, Jay Bertrand. Oh, yeah. yeah Grant Simmer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, well, actually, it was uh, Rolly Tasker and Dick uh, Lawson, Dick Lawson, who was one of my you know, crew blokes, and good mate, and he uh, he suggested when I got the gig to get a crew together, both he and Roly Tasker suggested suggested uh, John Bertrand because he'd won the national mm. title and up in, I think he won it up in uh, uh, Port Moresby or somewhere. <laughs> right. But anyway, and uh, so as you know, three times I was. The helmsman, or skipper, he was in my crew. Yeah, yeah. And then I was his backup skipper when we won in '83. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll stay. I'll stay with the uh, with the open boats. Yep. Um, and take you to 1966. Yep. 
when the world's greatest yachtsman at the time and probably still would rank in the top two, Paul Elstrom, yeah. came out to contest the World 505 Championships in Adelaide, your home territory. That's right. And there was a famous victory for you and your old mate Maxie Whitnell when you won oh, the Worlds. Yeah. What, what a thrill that was. Oh, absolute thrill. And uh, Paul Elstrom was a super person, really just a marvellous yachtsman all round, all round. And uh, he bought his own boat and his own crew, but his crew, uh, one, I think one of the parents, he died. And so uh, he picked up, he picked up P Pearson, Malcolm Pearson, who was crewing for uh, John Parrington, who was the, won the world 505s mm -hmm. in, uh, in uh, Ireland a year or so before 66. But it was there that they asked if Adelaide could get a World Series. And interestingly, Pete, it was the, I didn't realise at the time, it was the first World Championship for an international class in the Southern Hemisphere, that particular regatta. Mm. And uh, Maxi Windle and Jim Hardy scraped past Elstrom. In fact, if I'd listened to Max more clearly, <laughs> We would, we would have scraped through with a bigger margin <laughs> because the strong wind race, race two, we went from a flat calm in race one, and we're in the middle of the fleet somewhere, a calm race, to a buddy gale race two off Brighton. And the day or two before, in, I think, in the national titles, Max Whitnell said to me, Jim, that gooseneck fitting, have you seen that Riley fitting on the mast? It's badly twisted. And I had a look, I said, yes, Max, yeah, I better get it in the vice and straighten it out. Well, I did, I put it in the vice and I straightened it out, but oh, big lesson. <laughs> the last mark, we had a, I wouldn't say a huge lead over Elstrom, but we had a satisfactory lead, under a minute, but it was a satisfactory lead, but we had to jibe around the bottom mark and beat up in this very strong wind to the finish at Brighton Jetty. And we jibed and the jibe was all okay, except the gooseneck fit, fitting decided that was its last jibe <laughs> and the boom shot up past the mast. Well, I should have, looking back, Pete, I should have just said, stay on the trapeze wire, Max. But no, Max came in with a bit of string and Elstrom, he's a, He's now, you know, dozen boat lengths astern. Now he's only ten boat lengths astern, and now he's only <laughs> he passes us, and we go from first to second. But uh, anyway, we beat him in the finish. Yeah, wonderful. And uh, your old adversary John Cuneo was there, and Freddie Neal. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, John 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 Cuneo. <laughs> at least, at least, I always thought it was good because it got. It got Cuneo out of the winning, winning, winning in the one class. Mm. Sharpies, Sharpies, Sharpies. And to Jim Hardy, I could sense late in the piece in the Sharpies, being fastest time race after race, I could tell the poor other blokes in the <laughs> fleet, are, they're getting a bit fed up. Yeah. You know, without, I'm not trying to say I'm... Me Tarzan. No, no. But, but uh, uh, and, and I was much happier to change classes. Mm. Have a go, have a yeah. go. Peter Shipway was in another class yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was a famous victory. And I think a, a great tribute to you was that many years later when you were appeared on This Is Your Life, yeah. um, the, the, the mystery guest flowing in from overseas was Paul Elstrom. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, that was a wonderful tribute to you. My word. Yeah. And he had the same ac accent as uh, the <laughs> sailmaker bloke that was working for Elstrom Sales. Yeah. But what was his name again? Uh, anyway, he yeah. was working for, for, for Yorn, Mike Fletcher, was it, wasn't Yorn, he? Was it not Jorn Helner, was it? Yeah, Jorn Helner. Yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> you thought it was Jorn Helner, but I could, the I screen could, opened, there was Paul I, Elstrom. I, yeah. I, I picked the, uh, <laughs> you know, the accent, but... Uh, but couldn't, didn't realise it. 
yeah. didn't realise. Yeah. So, Jim, that was 66, and then um, 68, you um, went to the Games, the Mexico Games, That's on the right. 5.5 class. How did that come about? It, it came about, I was runner-up again in the Flying Dutchman class to uh, Carl Rives and Dick Sargent. Dick, mm. Who was and crewing with you in the Dutchman? In, in, the, in, the, in the Dutchman, Andy White. Andy White, okay, from and, uh, Western Australia. Yeah, Western yeah, Australia. Yeah, yeah. No, Maxie Whitnell. Sorry, 64, Andy White. Right. And I made the you was Olympic went as reserve. Team as reserve. reserve. Yeah. Well, 68, 68, Maxie Whitnell was in my crew, but we got rolled by uh, Carl and, uh, and uh, Dick, Dick mm -hmm. Sargent. Mm -hmm. And I got picked again as the reserve and assistant manager to uh, to beautiful guy from the West, uh, Tony Manford. Mm -hmm. I got picked as reserve. But the Australian Olympic people did would not pick Varen Joey. And Bill Solomons and uh, Mick York and, and uh, Scott Kaufman had won the 5.5 trials, Olympic trials, but the Olympic Committee said, no, we're not sending that old boat. Well, Jim Hardy, I started a campaign to get the bloody boat in, the, in to get Baron Joey. And I became quite friendly with the Secretary General, ex-parliamentarian -par from Melbourne. I've, name escapes me, Pete, but uh, I, I started with our wine company. I was often in different capital cities. So I dug up the uh, Olympic representatives in different cities and put my story that jeepers, Bill Northam won our first gold medal ever. Surely his boat that's won, it's won the right that you should pick it, etc., etc., etc. And in the finish, in the finish, the Secretary General bloke in Melbourne rang me and he said, Jimmy, he said, I've got some news for you. I said, well, what's the news? He said, he said, uh, Mick York, the crewman of the boat, we've decided to send Baron Joey to the Olympics. I thought, oh, that's great. He said, well, Mick York, the crewman, he says he cannot get there a week or 10 days early in the advance party because he has business commitments in America for Borg Warner, I think it was. And he said, and so we, we said to him, you can't make that. And he said, no, we can't. Well, then you're not going. You're now, Jim, in the crew. You're, I said, well, that's a, that's a pretty nice payback. I can get the boat in the crew and then I'll get myself Self in the boat. So, uh, and Bill Solomons was a good helmsman, but a bit calm, big waves, not very much wind. That was Acapulco, wasn't it? Acapulco, Acapulco yeah. yeah. Mm. So we, we were a bit, a bit, we needed more breeze, but it was... Uh, Wonderful experience. Mm. Wonderful.